Good day. I'm John Fernandez. Welcome to a special edition of eNewsline Live from AACSB's World Headquarters in Tampa, Florida. Today we will discuss a topic that affects all AACSB accredited schools and those in process, as well as the organization itself, the proposed new accreditation standards that are up for vote this April in Chicago. Over the past few years, the Blue Ribbon Committee on Accreditation Quality, often referred to as the BRC, has worked diligently on enhancing the current standards by drafting a new set of proposed standards that will be more uh, focused, uh, flexible, and relevant to global business schools. We are pleased to have Rich Sorensen, Dean of the Pamplin College of Business at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, and Chair of the BRC, join us today to share his insights on the development process of the new standards, and more importantly, discuss what these new standards mean to AACSB accredited business schools. Rich has been actively involved with AACSB for close to 40 years. His work includes serving as chair of AACSB and chairing committees such as the Accreditation Quality Committee, the Committee on Issues and Management Education, the Nominating Committee, and the Doctoral Faculty Shortage Working Group, as well as the Original Business Accreditation Committee, just to name a few. He also served as chair of the Global Foundation for Management Education. Uh, we are very grateful for Rich's years of service to the organization and to management education at large. His experience and knowledge of AACSB and the accreditation processes were vital uh, in drafting these new standards. Rich, it's a pleasure to welcome you to eNewsline Live. John, thank you. I'm happy to be with you. Well, we've had an exciting time the last uh, 26 months or so um, drafting these new standards. It's a process that I know that Rich was, is uh, glad to tell. It's a very good story. Uh, and it's been 10 years since we uh, had new standards on our plate. So this is an, a very important time for management education at a, at a great, very critical stage of its, uh, of its development. Getting into our first question, uh, a lot has changed since 2003, the year the current standards were introduced. Why was the Blue Ribbon Committee appointed uh, at this time? John, as you pointed out, the current standards were approved in April of 2003, and they were based upon the practices in uh, collegiate management education at the time. They represented some of the initial aspects of the globalization for the um, AACSB, but things have really changed since that time period. Uh, back in uh, September of 2010, the Board of Directors decided that they really needed to do more to respond to the changing environment. They needed to do more to really to shape the future of management education over the next 10-year period. You know, if you think about it, the world has changed. Uh, the whole concept of globalization is so much different when we talk about it today uh, than it would have been uh, 10 years ago. If you look at the technology and the ability to communicate with each other and the, many of the things that our students uh, take for granted, it's different than it was 10 years back. Uh, if you look at the delivery of uh, higher education, there's so many more uh, distance education programs. I know my own school has gone through significant reductions in budgets and state funding. Uh, if you look at the issues of accountability and many state legislators and boards of visitors and others uh, are holding schools more accountable. Uh, things have changed. If you look at the AACSB membership also, more than 300 of our members are non-US, and also about 150 are accredited members. That compares to a much smaller number back 10 years ago. So I think the board is right. We really had to change, and that's why the Blue Ribbon Committee was formed. Well, things have changed a lot in my 13 years. I imagine in, in your 40 years that change is simply <laughs> immense. Well, how have the new standards been designed uh, to help business schools face the variety of challenges uh, in both management uh, and higher education's landscape? Well, what we did is we had an opportunity to meet with a number of our members and we'll, uh, over a two-year period it was very interactive and, and having a chance to receive feedback. We found that the uh, members continued to favor the concept of the uh, mission-based accreditation they felt that the peer review process was very appropriate. Uh, they also felt that uh, the, the way that uh, uh, it, it actually is tailored to the school was, was critical. But they also realized that we needed to, to, to change, that we needed to 
have more flexibility in the process. Many schools felt as if they were being restricted uh, by the standards. They were trying to meet requirements that perhaps didn't match with that particular school. And the fact that schools needed to be more innovative was one of the areas we looked at. Uh, we also realized that uh, some schools were operating uh, somewhat separate from their audiences. Uh, for instance, uh, when they were developing curriculum, they may not have had the opportunity to interact with business constituencies. Uh, when, even if you look at the old standards, uh, for instance, we didn't talk about the teaching process. We talked about research. Uh, in, in addition, in, in, the, uh, in, in the older standards, there were other areas that were, were somewhat to disconnect. Uh, we, we talked about research as publications, but we didn't look at the broader concepts of scholarship. Uh, and so we realized that the, also that the students uh, in their preparation for jobs and their involvement, uh, we needed to look at areas such as their graduation rate, we needed to look at their employment, we needed to look at the impact that they had on their constituencies. So we look at the impact of accreditation and the impact of the faculty, the impact of the students. And you know, the only way we can do that is by being involved with our constituencies. Uh, the students have to have opportunities for experiential learning, they have to have the opportunity to to uh, learn more about the different uh, job opportunities that they're preparing for. Uh, faculty research should inform businesses and businesses in turn should inform the faculty as far as research topics and the availability of, of uh, uh, different resources, availability of their companies. And so the whole area is engagement. So what we've done is we've actually continued the peer review process and we focus more on the innovation, impact and engagement. Well, the proposed business and accounting standards are up for vote uh, actually on April 8th. It's coming up soon at the International Conference and Annual Meeting uh, in Chicago. And I'd add as a size bar that uh, that event is quickly getting to capacity. So if you haven't registered, you might want to do so very soon. Uh, can you go over, Rich, uh, some of the, the main themes and objectives that the proposed standards hope to achieve? Well, I guess what I'd like to do, John, is share with you some of the things that we did in preparation for, for being where we are and then, then look at those things because I think it, it comes out of some of our studies. The AACSB has its own think tank, part of the Board of Directors Committee, and that is a Committee on Issues and Management Education. And a few years ago, uh, a report was done under the leadership of Joe Ludo from Ohio State University that looked at the whole issue as far as uh, faculty research. And what it did is it looked at the issue of the impact of that faculty research and realized that it had to be impactful. It had to influence other researchers. In some cases, it had to influence uh, business practitioners. And the faculty had to look towards ways that, that it could uh, have practical applications. Uh, well, we actually use that as one of our starting points. Uh, when we looked at the current standards, we realized there were certain areas that weren't covered. Again, we looked at faculty research, but we didn't look at teaching. Uh, we, we looked at student uh, admissions. We didn't look at their uh, graduation rate and their placement. So we realized ourselves that things had to change. We also looked and, and actually had appointed uh, three different task forces to look at things that were uh, developing in uh, management education. Uh, we had one on distance education, and we were tempted at one time to actually have a, a separate standard on distance education, but instead we decided we would integrate it within the uh, rest of the standards. We looked at the impact of executive educations because so many schools are so much more involved in executive education. It influences the reputation of that school and its market. It influences the role of the faculty. So we had a task force there and we did actually put a standard in as it relates towards the executive education. And we know that many schools were, had issues having to do with the unit of accreditation. That is, is, is the entire school subject to the accreditation or would individual uh, units within that school, I should say whether the entire university or units within that. And we've had the task force there. So these task forces were very helpful as allowing us to look at topics that we thought were important and eventually were incorporated into the accreditation standards. I think that's a, that's a significant change from the support process and resources uh, for the standards that uh, were approved in 2003, our current standards that the Committee on Issues in Management Education, beginning with the, uh, the original uh, Management Education at Risk uh, report, uh, has done a, a great job of looking at issues that have informed the direction, not just of AACSB, but management education. 
and they continue to do a great job. So I know you chaired yeah. that committee, <laughs> and you're yeah. one of the great uh, leaders that we have had of that committee. Yeah, John, there's one other thing I think that we have to look at, and that is that we also had the opportunity to meet with a number of the different committee chairs, the operating committees. So we met with the initial accreditation committee. We met with the uh, maintenance of the accreditation committee. We met with other people in, in different positions of leadership, the accreditation coordinating committee. And in each one of them, they actually had practical day-to-day -day examples of ways that the standards works, but also ways that they didn't work. And I think by having that broad input from, from the operating committees, we also were able to, to get quite a bit of guidance and, and help. That's right. A lot of good counsel. There were many possible areas where the BRC could have focused its attention. Could you explain what the overriding findings of the BRC were? Well, again, the membership really did value the fact that we were mission-based, that is, that the standards were actually applied uniquely to that particular school based upon what its mission is, that we have a peer review process that is, is just outstanding by the fact that it looks at the school, but it also is very collaborative in assisting the school, and that it should be guided by the standards rather than dictated by the standards. So the standards are very helpful. They give us a sense of direction, but there also has to be the element of judgment. And if we really are going to be looking at the issue as far as innovation, impact and engagement, that innovation has to mean that each school could be quite different and that the application of the standards have to be unique to that particular school, which brings up the whole area of judgment. And so the current, the proposed standards have much more issues of judgment uh, on the part of the peer review team and on the operating committees of the AACSB. And of course, to do that, you have to have experienced reviewers, but you also have to have training and education that will actually assist the reviewers, assist the school, assist the committees in developing a global judgment. So what it really means is that there is a significant need for training uh, on the part of all of these individuals. And I know that the AACSB has a number of programs in place in order to assist us as we make that transition. I really like some of the leaps the new standards take uh, with the, the theme of innovation and uh, impact and engagement and mentioning back earlier to the Committee on Issues of Management Education, the the focus on business school's role in leading innovation on campus really came out of that committee, and that leadership has come out of AACSB's uh, work. The, the, the leap of, of emphasizing engagement of faculty and practitioners, uh, somewhat new emphasis on that, or, or more definite emphasis of students with students, and students with uh, practice uh, are very, very important to the relevancy of business schools. And in the end, it should mean higher impact of business schools, uh, better leadership on campus, in higher education, and in the development of global economies. So I, I just commend you and the, and the committee. Uh, I hope I'm not too redundant saying that through this discussion for the wonderful work, the thoughtful work, uh, the engaged work that uh, all of you did. It's very helpful to us to have those resources from the Committee on Issues of Management Education. We very much value that. What process did AACSB use to ensure the relevance and rigor of updates to the current standards? Well, it was very interactive. It was actually over more than a two-year period, and it allowed us to uh, meet with some of the folks I just made reference to as far as internal to the AACSB, but we also thought it was very valuable to meet with the membership, and so we did. Uh, we used the uh, ICAM, the International Conference and Annual Meeting, as a starting point to announce the Blue Ribbon Committee. We had opportunities to receive feedback from the Dean's Conference. Uh, we had opportunities to meet with the annual accreditation uh, conference membership. And, and I think many would realize that we also have a similar uh, conferences in, in, for European members and also for the Asian members. And so uh, we also use the regional meetings of the uh, various uh, uh, US schools in order to interact during the first year, we were trying to find out what some of the main issues were so we could be better informed. And initially, there really weren't that many issues that came up because a lot of people are happy with the standards. But the more we could actually report back on, on different disconnects, then the easier it was to get more people talking. And so over the first year, we gathered that information. And we went out and actually had many of the same meetings, and we actually discussed what some of these issues were. And we discussed them in general terms to see if the membership agreed with us, and they did. And then towards the tail end, we actually had the draft standards. And we had the opportunity to distribute these standards in September on a draft form. 
We then met with a lot of the regional groups I made reference to for the second time. Uh, we had the opportunity then to even make some adjustments based upon the feedback from the membership. And so the standards were, were more recently distributed to the membership. I think many of you know that we also are in the process where we're actually are having uh, professional editors review the standards. Yeah. Yeah. And within the next few days, they actually will be distributed to the membership. So it'll have plenty of time for them to review them before the, the April vote at, uh, in Chicago. Yeah, I hear the editor is a real ringer. It's actually Tricia Basu <laughs> of our biz ed staff who's done yeah. a wonderful job. And they'll be uh, coming out uh, soon. Uh, we, we talked a bit about the process. Maybe this will allow us to get a little more finite. But the, um, uh, can you comment on the changes, the proposed standards uh, that resulted from the feedback uh, and commentary from the community? Maybe some of the specific things yeah, that yeah. members said we should do. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Uh, we have the error of eligibility. These requirements that the school must meet uh, in order to move forward in the accreditation process. And uh, they're actually reported to the AACSB two years in advance uh, to assure that the school is ready to move forward. And in one of the standards that we had proposed under the eligibility requirements, it talked about ethics and it also uh, talked about uh, diversity. And we discussed this with the uh, various groups. And in this case, I think it was the AICPA indicated that they were quite concerned if you put two items so important in the same requirement that someone might look at it as a trade-off, one or the other. And so we realized it really didn't make any sense putting these together. So what we did is we actually separated out ethics as a separate eligibility requirement. And then rather than looking strictly at diversity, we looked at the whole issue as far as uh, corporate uh, and individual social responsibilities. And so we actually uh, changed that part of the standard. When we looked at the unit of accreditation, that is whether a sub-program within an institution can come forward with its own a separate accreditation request. And this happens so often in a global context where you have different uh, schools of law, schools of management, schools of this and that, uh, often uh, separated one from the other geographically and with different faculties. Uh, and how do we actually have some standardization in allowing US schools to have a considerable uh, opportunity if they would like to take advantage of that? Some schools were concerned that perhaps we weren't rigorous enough as far as to outlining on how that decision would be made and how rigorous that process would be. And so we changed it. We, 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 we made it more rigorous. Uh, there were other areas, too, that had to do with the financial strategies. In the uh, draft standards, we asked the school to actually present what its strategy would be in case there was a reduction in funding. Well, the members you pointed out to us in a very short period of time, that means that if you're going to eliminate a department or eliminate a subfield, you're going to be public in doing that. And that doesn't make faculty feel too good. Mm -hmm. And so we decided is that it's important that the uh, school have the uh, plans as far as what it might do uh, in a contingency, but this would be reported verbally uh, to, the, uh, to the accreditation uh, group. Later, I know we're going to talk about the, the whole issue as far as faculty classifications and the new matrix that we have there. We thought it was important to provide additional information in that matrix and even some things as simple as changing some of the terminology. For instance, one of the uh, quadrants actually had, uh, I think it was GA we used for it. Uh, well, people said, or perhaps it was RA, whatever it was, uh, people said this is used for a different purpose and we really shouldn't have terminology that was easily misunderstood. Um, so th there are areas that may not seem uh, critical but to the membership, they made a difference, and we made sure that we listened to them and that we actually made changes based upon their feedback. It's nice to go through a process where you have 667 uh, separate qualified uh, quality assurers in the process. It helps. Let's talk more specifically about the new standards and how they differ from the current standards. Can you provide a general overview of the, the four sections? Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, the first part, again, is the eligibility that the school has to meet those requirements uh, before they can move forward. And here what we've done is we've established the uh, separate areas that are values that the school espouses to. So we put our values right up front, and that's the ethical behavior, the issue of collegiate environment, which we define is referred to in the current standards, but there's no definition and it really is not oper uh, operable. And then we've looked at the commitment to corporate and social responsibilities. So these are part of the core values. 
we also have the, the foundation for review, and that is the decision on the scope of accreditation has to be determined ahead of time. That same requirement also talks about the AACSB membership, which was not well defined as far as the requirement to move forward. It also looks at the whole issue as far as oversight, sustainability, and continuous improvement. And these were referred to earlier, but they're actually grouped together more. In fact, that's really one of the main changes is before we had things that were kind of a little bit here, a little bit over there, we had some things that were duplicative. And we tried to do is we tried to make it so each one is freestanding, each one is important on its own. And then the whole issue as far as policy of continued adherence to the standards, uh, as well as integrity in the submission of data. There was a statement that was at the very end of the standards, it wasn't even part of the standards, it talked about the, the integrity uh, of data, uh, but it wasn't part of the standards. Well, now it is. The second part has to do with the strategic management and innovation. This looks at the mission, it looks at the intellectual contributions, it also looks at the financial strategies that actually support that mission. And so these are all tied together. Basically, what does the school want to be? What does it want to do? How does it interact with its audiences? What are the requirements as far as the intellectual contributions of the faculty that are participating? And we look at this by groups. So if the school's organized by research centers, then we look at one research center, we look at another. If the school's operated by faculty, in my case, we have the more traditional uh, departmental affiliation, then we look at it there. Uh, and then the whole area as far as how the resources are being applied. And we expect now, since it is mission-based, that if a school has a particular focus in a particular area, that that faculty would be stronger, that they would be more aligned with some of the accreditation standards. And yet there's other areas that could not be core to the mission of the school, and we might see radical differences. They might have more people that, that would have a, a clinical or practitioner backgrounds, for instance. When we look at the uh, other parts of the standards, we look at the participants. In this case, we're looking at the students, the faculty, and the professional staff. When we look at the students, we look at their admissions, as we previously did, but we also look at their progression and their career development. I mean, they're there to get a job, and so we want to make sure that that's actually what happens. When we look at the faculty, we look at the various roles of the faculty and how they're actually deployed, and we're actually expecting there'll be differentiation when they're deployed in one particular department versus the other. And then we're also looking at the professional staff. Uh, I know many schools, uh, for good reasons, have hired many more clinical faculty and people that would have a professional background in their uh, organization. Uh, years back, and, and you mentioned over the numbers of years being involved, a number of years ago, these people may have been hired for one or two or three semesters, and then someone else would be hired behind them. And that's not what happens today. Today, these people become integral parts of the faculty. They, they're uh, major uh, players. They, they have a significant role in the educational process and yet the current standards don't actually refer to any type of developmental work for these people. So now we're looking to see how they're, they, they're not just deployed, but also how they're developed and how they're sustained. When we look at the areas of learning and teaching, uh, the standards refer to curriculum management and assurance of learning. This is the concept. Do you have the right curriculum in place to start out with? Uh, for instance, you know, do you, should you really have a major in accounting? Should you have one in information systems? Should you have one in marketing communications? And then we look at the assurance of learning within there to see that they actually have the learning goals and that the learning goals are being met. Uh, again, the current standards don't talk about management of the curriculum, they talk about the assurance of learning. We look at the content, we provide more information to the schools as far as ways that they might be able to develop that content. One of the things that came out of the study that was done relative to the distance education is the need to have interaction. Interaction between the students, interaction uh, between the students and the faculty. And it was very critical. If you're not careful, a distance education could be no more than just a, a mailing a set of slides or a mailing a book out to, to a student and say, you know, tell me something about it two weeks from now. It's, it's got to be more than that. And so what we've done is we've actually uh, had the standard that talks about the interaction that's an important part of the teaching uh, learning process. Uh, and then we also include the teaching effectiveness and again, that wasn't part of the early standards. We assumed it was there, but it actually wasn't. The part we also, uh, John, we talked about is engagement, and, and I appreciate your making your comments because it's so critical that that be part of the, the teaching learning process. And the third part has to do with academic and professional engagement. 
Standards have to do with the student academic and professional involvement or engagement. It also involves executive education. This is the point that we had mentioned earlier, that many schools have extensive involvement in their executive education. It provides services to their constituency. It influences their reputation in their market. It provides sources of revenue in order to support the unit. Uh, it also provides opportunities about some of the uniqueness of that program. Uh, for instance, in our own case, uh, at uh, the Pamela College, we have a program with the Virginia Police Chiefs Foundation that actually helps mid-level law enforcement officers develop leadership skills that allow them to move to higher levels in that organization. Well, that's, that's unique to, to us. And somewhere or another, the accreditation process has to know that. They have to be informed about it. They have to know what impact it has on the faculty and other areas. And so this whole area of executive education is actually included as one of the standards, standard number 14, because it has such an impact on the school. And then, of course, the whole issue having to do with faculty qualifications, what's the preparation of the faculty as they move into their teaching role, but also what are the activities of the faculty now that they're, they're in their particular positions? Do they continue to be engaged as a researcher? Do they become more involved as far as their engagement with their business constituencies? And so that's basically an overview, but I think it's each one stands by itself, each one is holistic. And I think uh, taken together, it is significant advancement to the uh, teaching learning process for business schools. Well, I think that's a very uh, a thorough, but yet concise summary of the standards package. Uh, one of the things that I think are, is particularly great about the new standards, the proposed new standards, is that it's a classic case of doing more with less. Rich pointed out, several different areas of, of emphasis that, that help to make business schools better. Uh, and we've done it in 15 standards as opposed to the current number of 21. And I believe the total package of standards and guidance for implementation has dropped from about well, just over 80 pages to just under 50. So it's, it was very good, very focused, very concise, and very relevant work. So again, congratulations good. to the group. Um, we, we've talked about some of the changes, but uh, can you discuss in more detail some of the advantages that you see to schools uh, of implementing these new standards, what, what they might be able to, to get out of it? Well, John, I think the standards really are more holistic. We, we need to look more at just what the uh, students' uh, uh, eligibility is, how they were admitted. We need to look to see all of their activities they're engaged in. They're encouraged to be more involved as far as different experiential learning, and we're looking at their their uh, graduation, we're looking at their placement. So obviously this is gonna help. Uh, but the fact that we are also looking at the standards from the concept of, of uniqueness to that school, so we're looking at mission-based, and we really are mission-based. Uh, you know, the funny thing is the early standards really were meant to be more mission-based than they ended up being. But they kind of, after a few months, they kind of got the, cemented in place and they, they didn't change much. But I think the school will really find that the standards will adapt to their particular unique mission, allow them to better present themselves in the accreditation process, and there'll be more flexibility. And I really do think that this flexibility is, is so valuable in today's market. Yeah, it is. Uh, th there's one area that I want to uh, press on a little bit about, and that's that historically in AACSB standards, we've had a very strong focus on developing the ethics of the individual and the ethical behavior of the organization. Uh, and I think that's a particularly important, but primarily US-centric orientation, at least in history, very well placed. The new standards retain the emphasis on ethics, but as Rich pointed out earlier, they expand emphasis in, in a much more appropriate in the global sense to include the social responsibility of the business and the sustainability of the enterprise itself. I think society is looking for a broader uh, behavioral or performance measure uh, of success of businesses than uh, the historical focus on simply doing uh, the, the right thing ethically. So the, this expansion, we hope, will cause business schools uh, worldwide to educate their students to understand that ethical behavior uh, and the social responsibility of the business and the sustainability of the enterprise are all significant and clear expectations of global society. 
AACSB is also revising the accounting standards uh, for as we have uh, over 170 uh, schools around the world that are accredited uh, for accounting in addition to business. Therefore, could you discuss the, the parallel work of the AACSB Accounting Standards Working Group? Well, it turns out that the uh, Blue Ribbon Committee on Accreditation Quality uh, is primarily consists of business school deans. In fact, that's one of the good things about it. I think it was dean driven and it was well supported by the staff. Some of those deans actually had accounting backgrounds. And so what we did is we actually took a subgroup of the Blue Ribbon Committee and we supplemented that with accounting department heads and also accounting practitioners. And we asked them to, to assist us as a subgroup to develop the, the accounting standards. They actually waited some time in order to develop those standards because they wanted to see that they were fully integrated with the business school standards, with the Blue Ribbon Committee's recommendations for their standards. And so here a number of months ago, uh, the task force actually interacted with the AICPA it had the opportunity to interact and benefit from the Pathways Commission work that was done in accounting education. It also had the opportunity to interact with different uh, accounting uh, uh, administrators, uh, academic administrators in their groups. And uh, it was able to then do the same thing. It could get information on what some of the issues were and how the standards should be changed in order to see that they're, that they're stronger. Uh, they also had the opportunity to have a draft distributed and that draft was commented on by many of these same groups. And it was actually part of one of the accounting accreditation seminars uh, run by the AACSB. And so there's numerous uh, comments and things that were made there. Uh, but what it basically does, though, it, it closer uh, ties the accounting accreditation process to the business accreditation process and allows one to benefit from the other. What was the accounting uh, group's process in external review and feedback? Well, again, they, they did have the opportunity to meet with the uh, program administrators. Uh, they did receive feedback, in fact, uh, from the AICPA, what I referred to earlier as it relates towards the issue of ethics was the separation of ethics uh, from the diversity was from the, the uh, AICPA. And, and again, the, the involvement that they had with the, with the uh, uh, accreditation maintenance workshop. Um, the uh, net result was that they actually moved also from 15 standards to nine. And, and again, they tailored them much more closely to the, uh, to the business standards. Good. Well, what were some of the major changes that were recommended by the, the accounting review group? Well, it, again, currently is a little bit of a disconnect uh, with the accounting review and the business review. Mm -hmm. Right now, the accounting review ties much closer to the, to the uh, proposed standards. Uh, in addition, the uh, many accounting uh, schools of accountancy uh, have a particular focus on the preparation for the CPA and students' preparation for that examination. And this allows those schools that would want to use that as part of their review and part of their documentation to make a better use of the CPA exam and, and the exam results. In addition, instead of having uh, radically different accounting standards, they depend upon the business standards as it relates to its admission, the intellectual contributions and the financial resources, and they also depend upon uh, the business documentation. So rather than having completely separate documents, they're, they're much more integrated. You know, I, I was thinking also that one of the things that's um, important about uh, AACSB is that it's accounting accreditation. It's the only accreditation for accountancy uh, relating to higher education that, that I know in the world. Uh, there are other business school accreditations, AACS being, being the largest and oldest. Uh, but the accounting accreditation is very important. And one of the ways that we differentiate AACSB accredited schools in accounting is that emphasis on engagement and practical knowledge at the point of contact with business. Uh, the graduates of AACSB accredited uh, accounting schools come readily uh, uh, ready uh, to work. They've had practice experience in addition to the academic preparation. So I also want to commend the, uh, the AACSB Accounting Accreditation Committee led by Ray Whittington uh, and the, our friends at the Federation of Schools of Accountancy and the Accounting Program Leadership Group. You all had input to this process and we do uh, appreciate your efforts and support. All right, introducing new accreditation standards uh, will likely require some adjustment 
on the part of the schools as well as AACSB, to say the least. Uh, can you explain what schools need to take into account during the transition process to the new standards? Well, I guess there's a few things we need to do. And one is I think the schools really have to inform themselves very quickly as far as what the standards are and start experimenting. It could well be that some of the current definitions they use, AQ, PQ, have to be modified uh, to, to look at the new standards. Or they may decide that they don't want to make changes and, and, and keep some of the things the same. But in any case, the schools need to do that. I know the AACSB has a significant series of workshops and different programs that they're in the process of announcing uh, that would then uh, allow the schools to be better informed on the standards and the, and the various subsections uh, of the standards. Uh, I think the earlier the school starts, the, the better there be. Uh, we have to realize, however, there will be some time for them to, to go through this process. And in fact, that the implementation is going to be over a uh, three-year period. And in fact, one of the things we came up uh, when we looked when we met with the membership, they suggested if you're looking at the impact of research, and if that's different than what we're currently measuring, where it could just be uh, journal articles, that what we really needed to do is to have some time in determining what our school's goals should be and how we should actually uh, measure that and how we should implement it. And so we actually have a three-year uh, implementation process for the standards to allow the schools to, to make those changes. Right. Uh, so I think we've covered the transition well, and I, I'm anxious to, to move to um, uh, the audience questions, but I have one more uh, prepared question. I will say this, this episode will uh, go longer than normal because we had an unprecedented number of audience questions. We'd be finishing in a, a few minutes, but we're going to go on. Uh, last prepared question is, uh, during the past 10 years, business and society have experienced extremely fast change. Uh, in the future, this rate of change will probably increase, yet higher education has traditionally been known to move at a slower pace. How do we know that these standards will not become obsolete soon after being implemented, and how do we manage this risk? Well, John, you've got a real big question. The standards were designed to be flexible, and they're designed to be uh, individual to the particular school under review, mission-based. And so uh, we just have to, uh, to be ever vigilant to make sure that that's continued. Uh, when we have our workshops and training programs, we need to do that. We need to make sure that the peer review teams recognize that. For instance, if one of the operating committees, say the Maintenance and Accreditation Committee, receives a report that looks that shows that the overly narrow interpretation of standards by one of our uh, peer review teams. We, we need to get back to that team immediately to let them know that we, they can't actually narrowly define some of the standards. Uh, I think many of you know that we also have the uh, various operating committees, the accreditation uh, coordinating committee, accreditation quality committee, and these committees will have to continue to be vigilant in seeing that, that uh, we maintain the flexibility that's so important to our membership. And, and the board is looking at a, a committee structure, at least as far as oversight, that, that's uh, more efficient and more clearly communicative as being authoritative on um, uh, changes needed in between major works like the Blue Ribbon Committee. We think that we're, we're going to have to be on the ball each year uh, in adapting standards to make sure that they're, uh, they can be relevant. Well, we have a lot of audience questions, and uh, we'll move to the, uh, the first one. Uh, these are not prepared by us, so uh, if at some point they seem to be uh, maybe more individually focused, we'll handle that. Uh, the proposed standards have four faculty qualifications. Can you discuss in more detail the rationale behind the classification and implementation of the proposed new faculty definitions and the advantages of this model to schools? Well, John, I think we're referring to Standard 15 having to do with faculty. And what we're doing is we're examining how the faculty member actually got into their position. Did they enter it from the more traditional doctoral preparation where they have scholarly research as a primary focus? Or did they enter it from their uh, professional areas of interest? Or were they a clinical faculty member? Then what we need to do, we need to look at what their current activities are. So one of the uh, matrix has to do with the scholarly academics. You might say that's the same as we have with the AQ qualified faculty currently. Somebody that came into the profession by being academically qualified and continues to develop uh, their academic uh, credentials. 
And so uh, we, we see that that happens. We also realize that some faculty find this benefits of actually applying uh, their work to the, uh, as a practitioner, perhaps serving on a board of directors, perhaps being involved as a consultant, perhaps being involved in executive education. And even though the person may have a scholarly background, they're actually more applied. This would be the practice academics. Uh, again, many of the people that come to us from the uh, business world are ones that would be applied and also involved in practice. We refer to those as the uh, instructional practitioners. But wouldn't it be wonderful if some of these individuals work closely with our tenure track faculty, with our research-based faculty, use their practical applications to develop uh, different uh, articles, say in applied personnel administration or in real estate uh, management, and actually publish these. And so we see the opportunity for people to move from strictly a practitioner background to one where they're actually engaged in scholarly activities. And this would be the scholarly practitioner. Now, a lot of these things are happening today. But this really just legitimizes and allows more schools to, to look towards these various roles for the, for the faculty. Very exciting, the notion of uh, academics or the research skills interacting with practitioners and creating more relevant research that can be applied and help business schools lead business, which has been a challenge uh, for quite some time. The next question, with the new faculty qualifications uh, standards, it may be perceived that AACSB is raising the bar on scholarship, uh, saying now that 60% of the faculty must be engaged in scholarship. How justified would you say this is with limited resources and costs of doctoral faculty? Well, John, to some extent, I think what we're really doing is we're legitimizing the current role of faculty. If you look at those that are involved in scholarly academics, these are people that are academically qualified and would continue to be. Part of the concern of the Blue Ribbon Committee is that in some cases schools would present people under the academically qualified that may actually have been more in the practitioner role. But there really wasn't any way to show those persons except listing them under other and many schools didn't want to do this. We think this is, is going to actually better represent the practice academics that better represent what some of the activities of the faculty are. We also think that uh, many schools will look for ways to have their uh, clinical and practitioner faculty uh, greater involved in their research programs. It would only benefit and enhance the, the uh, research that comes out of those programs. And so uh, we think that this is a natural tendency for schools and so I, we don't really think it's going to be more difficult. It's just going to be that the, the role of the faculty is more broadly defined. And that's one reason why we actually have moved to a three-year implementation process, because many schools now have to decide how will they allow the uh, practitioners to be more scholarly involved if they want to. But think of the benefits that it would have to their business constituencies if, if they were to do that. Exactly. Well, many schools are already preparing for their next accreditation visit. This has come up. Uh, when can a school already in the accreditation process, and I assume this means uh, close to maintenance, they're close to their maintenance review, begin reporting using the proposed standards? Well, John, we think the schools should actually look at the standards and see how it would influence them uh, even before the vote. But actually, there won't be any change in standards until it's voted on in April. So therefore, it's going to take some period of time for the AACSB to be able to have the appropriate forms and requirements and training in place. And so more than likely, we're referring to somewhere about the January, February of uh, 2014 would be the earliest that a school would come up. But they wouldn't have to. In fact, again, it's a three-year implementation. However, any school that comes up for review in the 2016-2017 academic year would be required to have adopted and be reviewed under the new standards. Special consideration has been given to the proposed and the proposed standards to the JD uh, master's recipient uh, taxation. Uh, has AACSB considered designating credentials such as the CPA, the CMA, the CIA, uh, and several others as being qualified to teach in specific areas given their holders' level of, of hands-on experience and the fact that they have passed a rigorous exam which demonstrates their expertise in a specific area? Well, John, you know, we're really looking at two different areas. One is what was the preparation of that individual in moving into the uh, 
the uh, academe, into their uh, teaching role, into their faculty role, and often that's based upon their credentials and either the masters or the, or the doctorate, often it's a research-based doctorate. Uh, we're also looking how that faculty member continues to develop themselves, and that often has to do with the certification. Now, we do recognize the JD as having a research basis, and so we do allow the JD to be considered as in, in certain areas uh, as the, the appropriate uh, preparation in that particular area. Uh, we also recognize the CPA as being critical, particularly with the accounting part of the accreditation. And so we've kind of made leeway for those particular certifications. But there's many, many other certifications. You have them in insurance, you have them in the areas of financial planning, you have any numbers. And we're not prepared to actually extend the accreditation standards to include all of these. However, if a school has programs that are unique to those particular areas, and they wish to consider that type of certification as appropriate preparation, they have the liberty of doing that. At first blush, emphasis seems to have shifted uh, to curricular assessment uh, rather than on student learning objectives. Does this require a redirection of resources or simply more resources put into new areas while maintaining heavy emphasis on student learning objectives and monitoring? Uh, John, this really shouldn't require new resources at all. We're continuing to have the same focus as it relates towards the assurance of learning, development of learning goals, measurement of these goals, and actually taking corrective action based upon that. What we've done is we've actually gone back one step, and that is, does the school have the appropriate curriculum uh, based upon its uniqueness, its constituencies that it's trying to serve? Now, schools are currently making these decisions anyhow. They're, they, they, in their strategic planning process, they're trying to determine which curriculum are best for that particular school. All we're doing is adding it to the accreditation process, and so the school would receive uh, helpful and timely feedback through the accreditation. Very good. Okay, faculty qualifications are important elements uh, in standards two and in 15. What measure would you advise that AACSB use to determine the quality of refereed journal publications to evaluate whether a faculty member is academically qualified or not? And is there a list of acceptable journals? Well, John, we don't think that's the role of the AACSB. We, we think that's actually the role of the uh, faculty of the particular institutions, and that it's up to them to determine what the appropriate journals are for, for that particular school. Uh, and it has to be unique to that particular institution. I know some schools use certain processes. I know in my own case, since we're a, a doctoral granting school, we often would look at uh, some of the uh, lists that currently exist Francis, we start with the Financial Times list. But each one of the departments looks at their own subdisciplines and realizes that many of those aren't included in that particular listing. And that department has to determine exactly what the appropriate journals are. And don't forget, these list of journals are actually more for internal operations. And the faculty evaluation and the faculty promotion and tenure process, and that has to be unique to that particular institution. It would be uh, inappropriate for the AACSB to develop such a list in it's not their intention to do that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's my job to read the audience's questions, not to fix them, so <laughs> you'll understand. <laughs> Having said that, uh, I, I do think that AACSB will need to discuss more as part of its work of the Committee on Issues in Management Education, um, how it encourages, as part of its mission of advancing quality of management education worldwide, the development of, of journals uh, worldwide, because there is a centricity uh, in the United States and in developing country, in develop, in the developed world. And I, th I think that we do have a role to help in, in developing scholarship uh, and uh, publication opportunities around the world. What that role is, I'm not, not saying, but, but uh, there is a bit of an unevenness uh, to, uh, in established journals uh, in Western society than versus uh, most of the rest of the world. John, I hope you would do that. But I hope in doing that, you would look at the process that's being used and assist schools in having a process yes. that would be uh, beneficial to them rather than necessarily having a standard list. Exactly. No standard list. The school's uh, engagement with internal and external stakeholders is important in the proposed standards. Uh, what should a school be focused on to ensure alignment of internal and external stakeholders as required in the new AACSB standards? Well, each school has to decide uh, who do they serve, who are their constituencies. 
and they have to develop dialogue with that constituency, and they have to benefit by receiving feedback from that constituency. I know a number of universities and schools have advisory boards, and sometimes it's a case you, you, you meet, you get together, the dean gives a two hours talk, and they all go home feeling well. But then, you know, two days later, you wonder, what did you really accomplish? I think you really have to discuss uh, what, are the, what are the needs of these uh, businesses? What are the skill sets that the students have to have? Uh, perhaps you even need uh, different subgroups and, and the strategic planning committee of your advisory board and another one having to do with student recruitment and placement. But somewhere or another, and one has to do with even faculty research topics. Somewhere or another, you've got to connect. The school has to connect with its constituency to see that it actually has the strategic mission uh, and the programs in place to meet that needs of that particular constituency. And that's really what we're looking at. Sure. And I think that's important for the business school, but also the business school as the lead representative for the university at large in making that relevancy and connection. So it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for schools. There are tremendous potential benefits to schools uh, in the new standards. However, it is going to take uh, quite a few years for schools to receive in, uh, many of these uh, benefits. For example, the great emphasis on professional uh, staff may take some time to implement. How do you realistically see the new standards being implemented uh, over how many years? You've covered that in some part. Uh, and does this mean fewer faculty? Well, I think part of the issue is that what we're trying to do is recognize what's currently happening within uh, business schools. And to some extent, we're, we're legitimizing that and we're enhancing it. I know one of the, the concerns that some of the members expressed was, well, if you have all these uh, clinical faculty and you're looking at the way that they are developed, uh, does that mean we have less focus on the, on the, uh, the more traditional uh, doctorally prepared faculty? Well, uh, it, it's already happened. And we're benefiting from uh, these particular individuals. And we're looking for ways to see that they're continuing to stay current and stay relevant and also integrating them better within the entire fabric of the institutions that we represent. Uh, so we're really not uh, looking at, to make changes as much as we're recognizing the changes that have been made. And what we're trying to do is to better manage the process that's currently occurring. The U.S. Department of Education requires that each credit that a student earns be associated with three hours of work per week, either in classroom or homework. <laughs> uh, why do the AACSB standards not mention this um, requirement? Well, one is because we're AACSB international. We have an international membership, more than 300 of our members, and we have the opportunity for a significant growth in, in international markets. Uh, many schools outside the United States do not even have a concept of credit hours. In fact, the student would register as a master's candidate. They would have the opportunity to attend different workshops, to interact with different faculty, to sit in on different presentations, there's no record kept in many cases of the hours that this person has spent, but they would actually then be subject to some type of a qualifying examination and also many times some type of a research paper. The standards couldn't apply to that. The other area is that the schools in the U.S. have regional accreditation. They're required to have that if they have Department of Education funding. And the regional accreditation organizations look at these issues with the U.S. school. There's no reason for the AACSP to try to uh, duplicate what's already being done for these schools regionally. That's right, and, and, and take it worldwide. I, as one of the pioneers of globalization, it's been a, a long mission that, that in many cases we've only uh, just begun, but in, in many ways AACSB does have to set the tone, the standard, in a global context uh, and not be constrained by elements that are, that are peculiar to one particular country. Uh, you can imagine with 45 countries accredited in one day, there'll probably be over 100. It, it would be difficult to maintain the uh, individual rules of one. So I think that was an sure. excellent answer. Well, can you offer uh, more clarity on the application of the optional new standard for non-accredited uh, executive education and what this means for business schools uh, existing collaborative partnerships with employers? Well, John, we think there's a false dichotomy if executive education isn't included in the accreditation review process. I know I personally have 
visit at schools where a major part of their activities were executive education, a major part of their revenue, and a major involvement of their faculty was executive education. What this does, it allows the school to present to the AACSB and actually in, in a non-evaluative uh, environment what they're doing in executive education, how it influences them with their constituencies, and how it influences their other programs. So I think what we really need to do is celebrate the involvement of the institution in executive education, but make sure that the peer review team and the other review committees are fully informed about it. And that's basically what Standard 14 does. If a school has some executive education activity, but possibly not 5%, uh, and does not want to include in its scope uh, executive education, would the school still be required to justify its portfolio of executive and non-degree education? Further, uh, would the school be required to put in an exclusion request to remove the standard from the peer review? Well, John, there's really two things that you've mentioned there, and one is the word justify. Uh, that was actually in the draft standards. We don't have that in there anymore. And so we're not actually asking the school to justify anything. We're asking them to tell their story. And as any of the other standards, they have the ability to make their own case. The standards are supposed to be guidelines. They're supposed to be areas that assist them. But if they think they're unique and they have different ways to present their information, they can do that. And if the school decides that they have more than 5% and don't want to report it, they can make that case. If they have less than 5% and they want to report it, they can make that case. So there really is flexibility within the standards to allow this type of uniqueness of the individual program. Well, Rich, I think we have reached the end of the audience's questions. And uh, uh, I want to thank you very much, uh, wholeheartedly, for taking tens of thousands of hours uh, of work and thought and uh, reducing it to such a concise performance in, oh, I'd say about 50 or 55 <laughs> minutes. I lost count. Uh, but it was, it was a wonderful Thank job, uh, and it's an honor to have you here. Uh, years ago, when, we, uh, we, when I began working in accreditation, I, I learned quickly that Rich was one of the most effective, uh, reliable uh, reviewers that we had in, uh, globally. And I, I, do, do, I, like, do I say that is because of your, your engineering background? <laughs> it <laughs> helps. But it certainly helps. Uh, he's done a wonderful job, and I want to commend him is chairing this Blue Ribbon Committee uh, effort. I, I'd also like to point out that earlier in the process, uh, Terry Grange of Grenoble Cold and Management was co-chair, uh, but uh, Terry became uh, sort of an AACSB employee. And since then, Rich has chaired this uh, effort uh, himself. But, I, but we thank Terry and all those uh, involved in the process. The last point I want to make is that uh, this is an, an enormous year for AACSB. Uh, in, um, I won't say losing uh, leadership, hopefully leadership taking on a different form, but in a number of key deans uh, in the world that are retiring this year. Uh, maybe they saw the new standards and said <laughs> it's time for uh, new leadership. Uh, but one of the most important deans in the history of management education, one of the, uh, the highest impact deans certainly that I've known, has been Rich Sorensen. Uh, Rich is retiring from Virginia Tech this year. But I am happy to say that, uh, that he will continue working with AACSB uh, substantially uh, in its peer review efforts uh, and other guidance. So Rich, again, thank you thank so you. much for everything. Thank you, John. And uh, we appreciate the time you've spent with us here today coming off of your, uh, your spring break. Well, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, share this information with the AACSB membership and wish them well on their, their accreditation travel. Well, and thanks to you, our global audience, for joining us during this discussion with Rich. Uh, I do realize that the initial broadcast for the Americas is sold out. Uh, there is still space for the European broadcast uh, and some also in Asia. Uh, but having said that, uh, this will be available by mid-day, uh, I would uh, say, on around the 8th or 9th of March for view in our archives if you weren't able to view uh, the broadcast in your region. Uh, please join us again in May for our next broadcast of VNL. Uh, until then, uh, I'm off to spring training, as you can tell. I'm in different garb today, uh, so I won't be here next week. Uh, I certainly hope that you all have a good spring training, 
And for those participating in the World Baseball Classic around the world, we wish you good luck. Go Red Sox, Red Sox and I say, go you say. Thank you and have a great day.